of my song, the joy of my heart, and the boast of my tongue. Thy free grace alone, from the first to the last, hath won my affection, bound my soul fast. Without thy sweet mercy, I could not live here. Sin would reduce me to utter despair. But through thy free goodness, my spirit's revived. And he that first made me still keeps me alive. Thy mercy is more than a match for my heart. Which wonders to feel its own hardness depart. Dissolved by thy goodness, I fall to the ground and weep for the praise of the mercy I found. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Great Father of mercies, thy goodness I am, and the covenant love of thy crucified Son. All oh, praise to the Spirit, whose whisper divine seals mercy and pardon, righteousness mine. All oh, praise to the Spirit, whose whisper divine seals mercy and pardon, righteousness mine. Hallelujah. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of His Spirit, washed in His blood. This is my story. This is my Praising my Savior all the day long This is my story, this is my song Praising my Savior all the day long Perfect submission, perfect delight Visions of on my side Angels descending bring from above Echoes of mercy Whispers of love This is my story This is my song Praising my Savior All the day long This is my Submission, all is at rest. I and my Savior am happy and blessed. Watching and waiting, looking above, filled with His goodness, lost in His love. This is my story. my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior This is my story, this is 
praise my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior. Acts 2, 1 through 11. When the time for Pentecost was fulfilled, they were all in one place together. And suddenly there came from the sky a noise like a strong driving wind, and it filled the entire house in which they were. Then there appeared to them tongues as of fire, which parted and came to rest on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and began to speak in different tongues, as the Spirit enabled them to proclaim. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven staying in Jerusalem. At this sound they gathered in a large crowd, but they were confused because each one heard them speaking in his own language. They were astounded, and in amazement they asked, Are not all these people who are speaking Galileans? Then how does each of us hear them in his native language? We are Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, inhabitants of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the districts of Libya near Cyrene, as well as travelers from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. Yet we hear them speaking in our own tongues of the mighty acts of God. The Word of the Lord. Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world. Red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in His sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world. world, there are many different kinds of people, different races and cultures and nations, and they all speak different languages. Do you remember the Bible story of the Great Flood? After that flood, the whole earth was one nation of people, and they all spoke the same language. These people decided to build a city and a giant tower whose top would reach all the way to heaven because they thought they might need to go tell God what to do. God came down to check out this tower that these folks were building, and he saw that they were going to get into trouble. The Lord said, These people have gotten too big for their britches. Let's go down there and fix this mess they're making for themselves. So the Lord scattered those people all over the earth and made them all speak different languages. And that was the end of them trying to build that particular giant tower. That tower that was never finished is called the Tower of Babel because their languages were confused and the people babbled. But that is not the end of the story. Last Sunday, you heard about Jesus' ascension into heaven. Before he ascended out of their sight, he told his followers to wait in Jerusalem and he promised to send them the Holy Spirit. So they waited. A few days later, on Pentecost, which we're celebrating today, Jesus' followers were in a room praying and feeling sad that Jesus was gone because, remember, Jesus had ascended into heaven and it seemed to these folks that he had left them all alone. Then suddenly, unexpectedly and without warning, the Holy Spirit descended as tongues of fire and sat upon each of them. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages. 
And when they went out, the people around them who spoke different languages all heard them speaking words that they could understand. Everyone could clearly understand the followers of Jesus no matter what language they spoke. So remember how the people at the Tower of Babel began as one nation, all speaking one common language, but because they got the big head, their language was mixed up and they were scattered all over the world? Well, on the day of Pentecost, God showed the world how he was fixing this mess and how his plan was making all people into one holy nation. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father Almighty. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Universal Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Bless the Lord, O my soul. O Lord my God, you are great indeed. How manifold are your works, O Lord! The earth is full of your creatures. Lord, send out your Spirit and renew the face of the earth. May the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord be glad in his works. Pleasing to him be my theme. I will be glad in the Lord. Lord, send out your Spirit and renew the face of the earth. If you take away their breath, they perish and return to dust. When you send forth your spirit, they are created, and you renew the face of the earth. Lord, send out your spirit, and renew the face of the earth. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the doors were locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you, as the Father has sent me, so I send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. Whose sins you forgive are forgiven them, and whose sins you retain are retained. The word of the Lord. alone from the first to the last hath won my affection bound my soul fast without thy sweet mercy I could not live here sin would reduce me to utter despair but through thy free goodness my spirits revive and he that first made me still keeps me alive thy mercy is more than a match for my heart which wonders to feel its own hardness depart dissolved by thy goodness i fall to the ground and we for the praise of the mercy I found. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Great Father of mercies, thy goodness I own, and the covenant love of thy crucified Son. Oh, praise to the Spirit divine, seals mercy and pardon, righteousness mine, all praise to the Spirit, whose whisper divine, seals mercy and pardon, 
righteousness mine. Let us pray. O Lord, Lord Jesus Christ, we confess that we have sinned against you in our thoughts, words, and deeds. We have had anxieties about the future, even though we proclaim you as Lord. We have failed to love our neighbors, and we have disobeyed your commands. Have mercy upon us, Lord Jesus. Forgive us our sins, and cleanse us of all unrighteousness that we may walk in your ways and serve you in grace and love. This we ask in your holy name. Amen. The Lord Jesus Christ is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Therefore, you are forgiven. You are cleansed of all unrighteousness, and you are worthy to partake of this holy meal. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him our thanks and praise. It is a right, good, proper, and joyful thing at all times and in all places to give you thanks, Lord God. We join our voices with the angels and archangels and all the company of heaven who forever sing this song. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. In the beginning, O Lord, you created us for yourself. But even though we have fallen through our disobedience to sin and death, you and your infinite mercy, grace, and love, since your only begotten Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, to live among us as a man born of a virgin. He suffered every hardship and adversity, every trial, trouble, tribulation, and temptation that we face, except without sin. Finally, he stretched out his arms upon the cross in perfect obedience to your will and offered himself as a sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. On the night on which our Lord Jesus was given over to suffering and death through the betrayal of a friend, he took bread, and after he had blessed it and given thanks to you for it, O Lord, he gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. After the supper, he took the cup, and after he had blessed it and given thanks to you for it, O Lord, he said, Drink all of this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant which is shed for the remission of your sins and the sins of the whole world. Therefore, as often as we eat this bread and drink of this cup, we eat the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. We proclaim his death until he comes again. Let us proclaim the mystery of our faith. Christ, Christ has died. died. Christ, Christ is, is risen. risen. Christ, Christ will come, come again. again. Lord Holy Spirit, you are the giver of life in whom we live and move and have our being. Consecrate this bread and wine to be the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, and consecrate us, O Lord, to partake of this holy meal. All this we ask, Lord Holy Spirit, in the name of Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the glory of his Father. Amen. Therefore, we pray the prayer our Lord taught us, saying, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. May the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ keep you unto eternal life.
We thank you, Lord God, that you have fed us with these holy mysteries of the body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. By eating his body, we become members of his body and thus his agents in this world. Help us to be the distributors of your blessings, the agents of your providence, the instruments of your grace, and the ambassador of your love to all the people we meet in our everyday lives. By drinking his blood, we have taken on his life, which was not finally pierced by the cross, nor smothered in the tomb, but lasts forevermore. We thank you for this, the medicine of immortality, the antidote to death. All this we pray in the most holy and precious name of Jesus Christ, because he is alive and he reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit. You are one God, now and forever. Amen. 1 Corinthians 12, 3-7, 12-13 Brothers and sisters, no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. There are different kinds of spiritual gifts, but the same Spirit. There are different forms of service, but the same Lord. There are different workings, but the same God who produces all of them in everyone. To each individual, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for some benefit. As a body is one, though it has many parts, and all the parts of the body, though many, are one body, so also Christ. For in one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slaves or free persons, we were all given to drink of one spirit. Word of the Lord. Well, here we are on Pentecost Sunday, uh, seven weeks from Easter. We've uh, journeyed uh, during this time with the disciples as they experienced the risen Lord appearing to them at various times for 40 days. Last week, we talked about his ascension into glory uh, to be seated at the right hand of his father. And then uh, the disciples waited for 10 more days in Jerusalem for the promise of uh, the Spirit and of God's power working in them and through them. Uh, I'm sure they waited with great anticipation, but also not sure exactly of what to expect. And so today we remember the pouring out of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, well, what is for us the beginning of the church, the body of Christ, as God's way of working, continuing the presence of Christ in the world through those who are gathered together as his body, continuing the same ministry, continuing the same work, imitating and emulating Jesus. And that's what we have been called to do as the body of Christ and to continue uh, his work in the world. So we remember and think about all of that today. And so uh, we'll be looking at that this morning uh, through some of these passages we've read. And this past week, I also sent out uh, an email uh, starting us to think about what it would mean for us to meet together and under what conditions uh, should we do that and what would that be like. And so I sent just an email out uh, talking about some of the things to be considered. As far as I can tell, these are the matters that we have to take into account. And we'll think about that together and talk about uh, taking all those things into account, then how and when would it be good and appropriate and actually helpful for us to meet together again? Uh, what would that look like? So uh, I hope you've read that and I'll just continue the conversation that we will do this together. So this morning we're talking about um, Pentecost, the pouring out of the Spirit. And of course, the Spirit was not poured out uh, simply upon the apostles um, as to be something only for them because they were the apostles. It, it is the beginning of the pouring out of God's Spirit in a new way upon the whole world. Um, that's why uh, Peter, we didn't read that part this morning, but when, he, when he's preaching on the day of Pentecost, he, he quotes Joel the, about the old men and uh, old women, young men, young women, all, all people will be receiving this Spirit where in Israel's history, the Spirit of God was known to come upon people who were prophets um, upon those who were especially anointed, but it was certainly not a common uh, experience, not something that everyone thought about, well, the Spirit of God <clears throat> is living in me. Um, so it was it was a change. It was something that Joel had prophesied, talked about uh, that one at one time in the future, there would be a pouring out. And Peter says, this is it. 
This is the beginning of, of God being in the world in this uh, remarkably new way. <clears throat> and so what we think about and what we remember, which I think is very important for our hope and for our perseverance, for uh, having courage, is, is knowing that God is with us through his spirit. And that that very spirit of God, the very real presence of God dwells within each one of us and all of us collectively together who, who make up the body of Christ. And that the spirit is moving in the world um, and that God wants his spirit uh, to be in absolutely everyone. Um, and so we can take great courage knowing that Pentecost points to how God abides with us, how God is present with us, no matter what we're going through. Um, and that that animated the early church against their early struggles, against uh, persecution and opposition, against the various trials um, that they were facing. Um, they were sustained by that spirit, and they were also led by that spirit. Uh, certainly, it is the spirit of God that moves uh, the work of the church to the Samaritans through Philip and then to the Gentiles uh, initially through Peter and then later uh, more and more through Paul and the church in Antioch. Um, so the Spirit not only was present, comforting, reassuring, giving strength and faith to the believers, but guiding them forward. And while we don't always uh, see that and sense that in 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 the way of of, oh yeah, there's the Spirit, I can tell it. I can tell that's the Spirit leading me or sustaining me. Uh, we are reassured by this reality, by knowing this. And again, often we see it in hindsight. Looking back, we realize how God was present with us. So I think that's very encouraging. Pentecost is, is, a, is a way of thinking about uh, and being reminded of the way God is with his people. But the passage I want us to look at this morning is not Acts, uh, the earlier reading, but instead uh, 1 Corinthians 12. And we read verses 3 through 7, actually taking the latter part of 3 uh, through 7, and then 12 and 13. And in this section, uh, Paul is talking about uh, spiritual gifts. And when we read a text, we often bring our interest to it, you know, what, what it is that we... Uh, are, are questioning or thinking about, um, and, and that's appropriate. But sometimes that's not quite the same as the interest or the intent of the writer and of what he was trying to communicate. And I think that's one, one of the, the things that's going on in this text. Because as we read this text in 1 Corinthians 12, and Paul is talking about spiritual gifts, uh, we often see it as, as a text designed to explain to us um, the nature of spiritual gifts and the, and the diversity of the gifts that are given to the body of Christ. But I think actually what Paul is writing about is the unity of the Spirit. Um, the Corinthian Christians were well aware of the variety of gifts in the church. In fact, um, unfortunately, they were esteeming certain uh, gifts of the Spirit to be more significant, certain promptings and ways that the Spirit worked and moved in his people as, as being somehow better than others. And so they were jealous of certain uh, gifts of the Spirit and perhaps despised others or thought them just not that important. And so really what Paul is getting at is not trying to explain to them the reality of, of how the, they are gifted by the Spirit but the reality of how there is a single Spirit of God that is gifting all of them. Because their problem was not understanding the unity of the Spirit and the unity of God and how what God is doing, though God gifts his people in different ways, it is essentially to create a unity, a unity of purpose and a unity of mission and ministry. And so God uh, works in his people to create that common uh, good. Now, that's one of the, some translations will use that in this passage, the phrase, the common good, that there's something shared by all, uh, a good that is good for all. And yet God gets to that common good by equipping us uh, in various ways. So while we are not all exactly the same in how the Spirit moves within each one of us, 
and how uh, the Spirit prompts us to, to do the ministry and the work that we do, it is toward a common good, a, a shared, a unified purpose, and that all of this is coming from one Spirit, one God. And so his interest is a little bit more to establish the, the unity and the, the oneness of God, um, where we pro perhaps read it and think about um, understanding the diversity of the gifts. And so while our our kind of agenda and interest is not uh, invalid, um, but let's first notice the, the theme of unity and oneness that Paul is bringing out here. So the way he begins it in the second part of uh, chapter 3, where we started our reading, he talks about, no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Now, obviously, he's not talking about uh, just the words themselves. Uh, I could teach a macaw, a parrot of some sort, to, to say those words uh, without any sort of faith or meaning. Um, and so he's not talking about uh, that you can't actually form those sounds and, and speak those words in whatever language is native to you. But he's talking about, obviously, no one can say that with any sort of meaning, uh, with any sort of faith, uh, with any sort of understanding, except it is the work of God's Spirit. That when we can come to see Jesus as Lord, it is the Spirit of God who has brought us there. And, and the reason he starts here, I believe, is because this is something that all the Christians in Corinth had in common. They all said Jesus is Lord. And so uh, while they were thinking, well, I have this gift and this person, she has that gift or that person uh, over there has another gift. And they saw all this as, as kind of dividing them into those who had certain things and those who didn't. Um, Paul first wants to say, you all have the spirit in the sense that you were able to proclaim Jesus is Lord. And so there is a common uh, there is a common theme to what the Spirit is doing. It's moving all of us, first of all, to to a kind of fidelity, a kind of loyalty to Jesus as the Christ, as the Messiah, as the Lord, as the one who reveals to us who God is. And so that's fundamental. That that's basic. Um, that's that's what really God's Spirit is doing, and it's common to every single believer. Um, those who have perhaps uh, more obvious uh, ministry giftedness and those whose perhaps uh, ways in which they minister, in which they're gifted, is more subtle and, and unnoticed um, because some things are more obvious and some less. But, but Paul says, we, we've all been moved by the Spirit to say Jesus is Lord. This is the, the common work of the Spirit. Um, now, the way we minister, he's going to point out, though it's very, you know, varies, it's all for a common good. It's, it's getting us to live this life under the Lordship of Christ, following Jesus as, as our teacher, as the one who leads us. So, so that's where he begins in their common experience of the Spirit. But notice in verse 4, 5, and 6, he sounds a little redundant, but he's not really uh, just repeating himself. Um, he's talking about the Trinity. He says, now there are varieties of gifts, but the same spirit. Verse five, and then there, and there are varieties of ministries, but the same Lord. There are varieties of effects, but the same God who works all things in all persons. So he refers to the spirit, to the son and to the father. And, and so there's a little bit of a difference, and, and we do understand that um, the abiding of the Spirit within us and the giftedness, we think of that primarily as, as something coming from the Spirit of God, uh, the, the one that Jesus said he would ask his Father and the Father would send uh, to, to us, the Spirit, the one, the one who's the helper, the comforter, the counselor, the advocate, all of those ideas are, are part of what... Uh, it means for the spirit to be the paraclete in Greek. So, so we think of the giftedness coming primarily from the spirit. And yet, Paul wants to insist, though there are a variety of gifts, it's all from the same spirit. Um, there's a unity of the spirit. There's a oneness of the spirit that 
gifts us in different ways. And then he says there are varieties of ministries. There's different ways of serving, which is obviously related to that giftedness, but the same Lord, the one, the same Lord who teaches us to serve, who gives us the example of how to serve in whatever way we are gifted to do that. And then there are varieties of effects. I mean, there's different ways in which the things that uh, we are gifted to do and the ways that we serve, the different kinds of effects um, that occur as a result, whether people are encouraged, whether people are taught, uh, wh whether people are helped with physical needs. I mean, there's different effects. But he says, but the same God who works all things in all persons. So there is the Father. And we think of the Father as the source of everything, um, that the Spirit uh, of God uh, proceeds from the Father, and that the Son is begotten of the Father. Not that, not that there was a time which Jesus did not, or which God the Son did not exist, but, but we think of the Father as the ultimate source, and and that seems to be how Paul is referring to, to God the Father here. Uh, when he says God, he's talking about the Father. He's already talked about the Lord and the Spirit. So there are a variety of effects, but the same God, the same Father who works all things in all persons. That, that there is ultimately uh, the Father who is the source of, of all the effects of the ministry and the giftedness and what is happening. So again, look at Paul's interest. Paul's interest is in the unity that these Corinthians need to, to recognize. It's a unity brought about by the very person of God, God's self. It's the unity that they proclaim Christ as the Lord, Jesus is Lord. And they do that because of the Spirit's work. And there's a unity, even in the variety of gifts and ministries and the effects of what's happening, there is but one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, absolutely one and unified as the as the motivating and the and the uh, the source of all of this and the the animating energy for all of this and the power behind all of this one god and so then he's able to say in verse 7 but to each one is given the manifestation of the spirit for the common good and so the way all of this works out again is for for oneness, a, a single good, what helps us all. And we all need a common help. Um, we, we, we all need faith, and we all need encouragement, and we all need forgiveness, and we all need edification. We need to be taught. Uh, we, we need to be uh, helped to maturity. Uh, these things are common to all of us. Um, this is the good that we all need. We all need the good of, of salvation. And, and the good of hope and joy. And so Paul says, the various ways in which the Spirit is manifested among his people is for a single common uh, objective. So you've noticed as we've looked through this, the emphasis is on oneness. He's really not explaining uh, the, the variety of gifts as much as he's explaining the phenomenon of the variety of gifts should not be misunderstood to somehow not to 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 be against uh, seeing an inherent oneness. That despite how the gifts are many, we should be seeing a singular oneness and unity of God in all of this. Now, the way he brings this kind of to a conclusion, at least as our reading, we skip uh, our reading skipped over some of the. Um, uh, specifics about the giftedness. I, I plan on talking about that in our class uh, that we'll, f uh, we'll have uh, virtually at 1130. But um, our reading skipped down to 12 and 13, again emphasizing this unity. For even as the body is one and yet has many members, but it's a single body, it's the body of Christ, and all the members of the body, though they are many, are one body, so also is Christ. That, that Christ our Lord is absolutely one and unified. And, and the diversity of the body, 
does not indicate some sort of fractured, fragmented Lord, but we all compose a single unified body. And then he takes it in verse 13 uh, for them to reflect on their baptism, on the sacrament of baptism. And of course, that's a very uh, good subject for Pentecost as well, uh, because we think about how uh, Luke tells us in Acts that s approximately 3,000 people are baptized on that day, uh, wanting to be uh, initiated into this life of following Jesus, recognizing Jesus as Lord. And so it says, for, so uh, the text says in verse 13, Paul goes on, for by one spirit, here again, it's a single spirit who's working. We were all baptized. So baptism is not an action of, of human, uh, you know, effort or, or work. It's not the work of the one doing the baptized, baptizing. It's not the work of the person who is receiving baptism. It's, it's really a work of the spirit. Um, that's why I believe we should call it a sacrament and we should say um, something true and spiritual um, grace is occurring, is being bestowed upon us in this rite of baptism. Uh, not because of how we perform it, but because it is ultimately the work of the Spirit. For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of the one spirit. Um, some beautiful pictures there uh, about being immersed in the spirit and drinking in the spirit, uh, being immersed into Christ and yet receiving the things of God, um, drawing them into ourselves, this idea of being uh, drinking in the spirit and being filled with that spirit. Um, it, it somewhat reflects the language uh, of Pentecost as well, because it's it's uh, the language there is the pouring out of the spirit, um, as if the spirit is a liquid poured over us, an anointing that runs poured on the head and runs over the people, uh, but drinking it in, so covering us and filling us. Uh, some beautiful imagery about what it means for the spirit to live in the people of God. So I want us to think though. Uh, having gone through this text and, and noticed what Paul's emphasis is, I want us to think about uh, the importance of unity, the importance of how what God is doing is bringing us together with one another and as the catalyst for unity in the world, that God's uh, desire has always been to bring all things to himself. Um, this is This is God's wish from the very beginning for his creation is that there be a harmony a unity and that's really a lot of what we mean by peace uh not not division not uh anger and bitterness and and uh people being set against each other but peace um a, a kind of common unity and common life so what we know about pentecost is that it is a further um, a further working out of what God has always wanted to do is to bring the whole world together. And we need to think about that for ourselves. Uh, particularly, uh, we can think about it for our, our present time. Um, I think it's always true that there are things in our world that uh, seek to drive us apart. But the Spirit of God is... Uh, is so much more than anything in this world that we should not be driven apart. I mean, the things that uh, that can drive us apart, some are greater than others, um, but they can still have the same effect. I mean, we can find ourselves uh, put to the test about unity over this very pandemic. We know that people have different thoughts and opinions uh, about how is the best way to handle things, about what is the best way to uh, act. Um, even people uh, who are in authority, uh, people who have expertise, uh, have different thoughts. Um, and while there can be a general consensus on many things, even you'll find some variety there. Um, and, and we're no different. We're not even the experts. And, uh, and so sometimes we're not sure of exactly who to listen to, and we have our own thoughts. 
some of us might think um, that some of this is perhaps more overblown than it should be. And some of us might think that uh, others are taking this too casually and it's more serious um, than some are taking it. <clears throat> and so something as simple as how to uh, respond to this health crisis can have the effect of driving us apart. But the very essence of being Christians is to be people who seek oneness and unity because the God who is seeking us and who is working in us is always working towards that oneness. A kind of oneness that Paul says can bridge the gap between Jews and Greeks, between slave and free. And certainly in his day, those were some of the greatest uh, social distancing issues of his day. And yet he said those distances can be, can be uh, bridged by the Spirit. And that Spirit does that, closing the gaps uh, by giving us a common baptism and working in us to bring us into one body of Christ, whether we're Jews or Greeks. So certainly that Spirit can, can uh, help us not to become separated over our op opinions and thoughts and practices about what's best to do during this health crisis, during this pandemic. But we're also uh, in, in that wonderful time of year, and I'm being a little sarcastic, um, because it's always a trying time when, when our country has elections, and, and those seeking to be elected, um, well, they can't be unified because uh, they have to draw distinctions with their opponents. And sometimes people do that more honestly, and sometimes they do that less honestly. We recognize that. But the whole exercise is an exercise in division, in saying, vote for me and not my, uh, my opponent. And we may not even today say anymore, my esteemed opponent. You know, we don't esteem them. They're, they're awful, terrible people. Uh, so we can get drawn into those uh, patterns of thought. And I don't think that's what we should do as Christians, because something greater, even, even than the administration of our government and the policies that are put in place and whether laws uh, are made about one thing or another, and those things are important, but something far greater is the common good, is this idea that humanity ought to be coming together because God is one. And God's work among us all is to bring us together. And so that r remains our chief concern, even more so than who we think might be the best uh, person to fulfill a particular uh, office at a local uh, state or national level. And so during this time, I hope and pray that the spirit of Pentecost will be greater than the spirit of the elections and that the spirit of Pentecost will be greater than the spirit uh, of of the pandemic and the kind of spirit of rivalry sometimes it can or, or distancing uh, from others because of their thoughts and opinions or even what they're doing. It doesn't need to be that way with us. Um, we can practice a kind of unity and uh, so as I as I wrote in this past week as I started us on this process of thinking about uh, what it would mean for us to meet again it's one of those issues related to um, the pandemic, but it's also become a politically hot issue related to the whole electioneering thing. And so one of my concerns that I listed there is the things we need to be thinking about is how do we stay unified? It's something that we've worked hard, I believe, from the very beginning to cultivate as the very nature of our community, of our shared life of faith as a congregation to not allow um, the, the real differences of thought and opinion to separate us, but to allow that to be overcome by the love of God. Uh, while we may have very different ideas, the love of God sustains us and brings us together. The Spirit of God is working to bring us together uh, despite different thoughts we might have or opinions or preferences. And so one of my concerns is that uh, we continue uh, to live that ourselves and to model that for the world and to share it with others. Because ultimately that, uh, that oneness is what saves us. 
because it's the oneness that God gives us. And what God gives us is what saves us. And so may the spirit of Pentecost be with us now and always. Um, let me close us with prayer. Holy God, we thank you for the spirit that you poured out on the day of Pentecost and has continued to be poured out on all people throughout the world until this very day. And the spirit has been poured out upon us. Make us attentive to the spirit's leading, that the spirit is guiding us towards unity with others, uh, despite uh, cultural, um, social differences, uh, differences of opinion and thought that the Spirit is always prompting us to work for a common good. May we honor this working of the Spirit. May we be more in tune with it. May it be what truly uh, animates our imagination and livens our dreams for the future. And give us the grace to be patient in trying times. Comfort us through this same Spirit. And we thank you in the name of Christ our Lord. And in his name we pray. Amen. Inspire us to find constructive and peaceful ways to heal hatred and end violence. Fill, Fill us with, with your peace, peace O oh God. God. Inspire and protect missionaries, health care providers, first responders, and emergency aid workers. Fill, Fill us, us with, with your, your peace, peace O oh God. God. Sustain the hope of immigrants, refugees, and migrants who are separated from their families. Fill us, Fill us with your, your peace, peace, O God. God. Protect the unborn and show your tender care to women who face a crisis pregnancy. Fill, Fill us, us with your, your peace, peace, O God. God. Comfort the lonely, the sick, and those who mourn and feel the sting of death. Fill, Fill us, us with your, your peace, peace, O God. God. Make us mindful of the fragility and magnificent beauty of the natural world. Fill us with your peace, O oh God. Nurture Easter joy in the hearts of all the baptized and animate us to proclaim the good news through the gifts we have been given. Fill, Fill us, us with, with your, your peace, peace O oh God. God. O oh God, by the sacrament we celebrate today, you sanctify the whole church among all races and all peoples. When the Holy Spirit came down on the apostles, the gospel was preached to the world for the first time ever, according to your will. Pour out now the gifts of the Spirit unto the whole world, and through the hearts of those who believe in you, may the gospel be spread and your will be fulfilled. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. Amen.